So welcome everyone to uh, this Neurology Academy webinar uh, on the management of symptoms in the complex stage of Parkinson's, uh, which will be followed by a uh, symposium sponsored by Profile Pharma. Um, so yes, this is a webinar regarding the management of some symptoms of complex Parkinson's disease. My name is Robin Fackrell. Uh, I'm a consultant, uh, physician and a specialist in Parkinson's disease. I work in the uh, southwest of England in Bath, and I'll let my colleagues uh, introduce themselves. Um, but welcome to this meeting, and thank you very much to, uh, for you to joining us. And just to say as means of introduction that Parkinson's uh, remains to me uh, such a fascinating syndrome that as it progresses becomes much more challenging to treat with its balance of motor and non-motor symptoms. And I think that Parkinson's has often been a little bit mischaracterized as solely a movement disorder with a focus primarily on motor dysfunction. But I think the realization is much more now that Parkinson's is an assault on multiple neurotransmitters. And there needs to be a consideration in its management of all these pathways um, and also the management of the non-motor symptoms in conjunction with the motor, because sometimes they conflate, but often the non-motor symptoms are the greatest detractors from quality of life. So without further ado, um, to help us consider how we might contemplate the management uh, of patients with complex Parkinson's disease. I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Lisa Brown, who's a Parkinson's nurse specialist, um, who will introduce herself and uh, let us know about the non-pharmacological aspects of complex Parkinson's disease management. Lisa. I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Lisa Brown, I'm Parkinson's specialist nurse. I work at um, uh, Royal Derby Hospital um, and I'm going to talk today about um, thinking about some of the sort of non-pharmacological options, mainly looking at how the um, uh, psychiatric and other non-motor symptoms might impact on motor symptoms and how that might make Parkinson's management more complex. So if we start off by looking at um, some of the advanced symptoms in Parkinson's, uh, so obviously lots of motor, motor problems, but also lots of neuropsychiatric problems and also some autonomic difficulties um, as well. And I, I think it's really important that I've put in red there uh, some of the neuropsychiatric features. And I think in, in thinking about how we can ma manage the, um, particularly the motor, but also some of the non-motor symptoms, thinking about how uh, mental well-being and mental state can impact on that. I think that's really an, a really important thing to start with. Um, and actually how we talk to our patients about that is really, really, really important. Uh, it's also important to say that um, a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease aren't actually really very uh, dopamine responsive. So a lot of them aren't really improved by the dopaminergic medications that we use. Certainly the most, most of the motor symptoms are, but things like unrelated gait freezing and uh, drug resistant tremor uh, and not and postural instability also and, and some of the um, um, uh, dystonias some of the, like camp to come some of the posture related problems aren't responsive to leave the dopa medication uh, a lot of the new autonomic features are, can be made worse and also the psychiatric features can actually be made worse by Parkinson's medication so I think it is really important that we think about how um, we can help our patients um, uh, without using medication, using other, other things and other strategies. So thinking about motor fluctuations, um, initially often just wearing off of medication, and we, we, we have options with tablets that we can try and use to help that. Uh, not all people with Parkinson's experience wearing off, and this could often lead on, and in the very advanced Parkinson's patients that we see, we see a lot of on-off motor fluctuation, which can become extremely unpredictable with um, medications not working at all sometimes. And it's important to think about when that happens, why that's not, why that is happening and what else might be influencing how our medications uh, work for us. And I think Dr. Fackrell is gonna cover a bit of that later on. Um, so gait problems like fascination and freezing, and at, at worst, these on-off motor fluctuations uh, can be um, so bad that they have very little good quality on time. They're either very off with very significant motor problems or very dyskinetic with very good on quality on time in between. 
Often we look at advanced therapies um, for this, but again, it's important to explore with our patients what non-medication options we can use uh, to try and help, help these symptoms as well. Um, this is just a slide uh, demonstrating the reason for that. As the disease progresses, the, the levodopa effective uh, window becomes much smaller um, uh, and the half-life of levodopa, approximately 90 minutes, becomes more of a real-time uh, situation rather than that ability to store and use dopamine as and when it's needed. Um, so again, it's very important we have options to try and help that, that don't involve uh, levodopa. So the, just as, um, for those that aren't, aren't too familiar, this is a, um, a video of somebody with dyskinesia. Um, you'd probably classify this dyskinesia as, as fairly mild. I mean, she, she, she is a little bit wriggly uh, and it may put her off balance when she mobilizes. It's important to say often the person with the dyskinesia doesn't particularly notice that it's a problem. It's often family members that find it more troublesome and more distressing. Uh, it can obviously get so bad that, that people with Parkinson's, sorry, there's a bit of, um, you might find that interesting. That's um, our physiotherapist looking at how uh, a blue filter can improve dyskinesia. I'll, I'll perhaps show us, uh, finish playing it in a moment. But um, sometimes it can be very dis disabling, it affects the whole body. Um, uh, so sometimes it is important. But again, it's really important to think about ways that we can use that aren't medication related, uh, that don't mean we've got to reduce doses or try uh, medications like amantadine that, that can cause more problems than it solves, to be honest. Um, I will just finish playing that. There isn't a lot of evidence for this, but, but certainly some of our patients with severe dyskinesia do go out and buy blue lens glasses uh, and it can be helpful. So her dyskinesia hasn't gone away, but it, it, it seems to be a bit more settled. But again, is that because she's holding that blue piece of plastic in front of her face and she's doing something else that's making it settle but certainly some of our patients we do try it with them and it can be quite helpful um, and then thinking about freezing which is another really troublesome quite disabling symptom of Parkinson's that is sometimes um, responsive to medication changes particularly if it's unrelated sometimes adjusting the medications can help but often people oh, sorry off related but if often people get unrelated freezing so even though they are fully medicated and they maybe even be slightly dyskinetic with their medication they can still have quite significant freezing in certain situations um, and it can be extremely disabling and often they can do other things like walk uh, like um, run or walk backwards or cycle uh, very well I, uh, I know I saw, uh, saw a patient in town a town near me recently he wasn't a patient of mine he was really struggling with significantly freezing trying to walk through the center of town and he actually took off at a sprint and sprinted off uh, through town. So he couldn't, he couldn't initiate walking at all, but actually uh, he could run quite well. Um, freezing can respond really well to queuing strategies. I'm going to talk a little bit more about queuing strategies uh, on a future slide. Um, so this is a, just an example of another video of, of some freezing. So this chap's got very typical Parkinson's related in gait initiation problems and freezing. He shuffles a few steps and then his feet stick again and he freezes. It's going to just show you a, an example of a cue, so a visual cue to help this gentleman to walk. So clearly his, his, his ability to take a big step is not affected, but uh, the message from his brain to his feet to take that big step is very severely affected. But when you put a cue there, so when you you create another pathway, uh, give his feet another message, which is say, step on these pieces of paper. He can actually step quite nicely uh, and take big steps, but uh, and that's what queuing is all about. It's about overcoming and finding another way for that message to get from the brain to the feet to tell them to move. Uh, I just wanted to quickly talk a bit about dystonia, which is another very, can be a very disabling uh, symptom of Parkinson's particularly for people who have young onset Parkinson's. Often it's off-related, so often it's uh, that early morning dystonia that we often uh, treat with um, uh, overnight or early morning levodopa. But it can also be uh, wearing on and wearing off dystonia. Uh, and it can also be quite late levodopa-induced dystonia, particularly in younger people, I noticed that it, when you give them levodopa, they develop quite significant inversion of the feet which can impact on mobility and, and balance and things um, can, can make management quite difficult if, because bigger doses of levodopa just make the dystonia worse. Um, 
We can see neck dystonia, so torticollis, but particularly anterocollis, so the head drop. Uh, we do see blepharospasm in people with Parkinson's uh, and, and Camptochromia and Pisa syndrome. Uh, some of these dystonias can be uh, helped by dose manipulation. Botulinum toxin therapy can be helpful for some, but uh, and physiotherapy also, so teaching them to use stretches and that sort of thing can be helpful. Again, some pictures of dystonia. So typically uh, a, a lateral collis, a, a neck dystonia, an antero collis. Uh, and then this guy's got what I think is quite typically Parkinson's related uh, dystonia that's affecting his, his gait, his, his, his posture. Um, that arm going out backwards is quite typically. Um, so he's, he's quite affected by, by his dystonia. So um, thinking about the non-medication options that we can use, I think um, things that we can do to help our patients is actually discussing their symptoms with them and discussing how they happen for them when they happen, uh, reassuring them that it, things are part of their Parkinson's, putting them into context. So um, uh, looking at their day-to-day -day and looking at what might be impacting them on them. Have they had a good night's sleep? Are they a bit constipated at the moment? Um, how are they taking their medication? Is it with food? Is it away from food? Educating them about um, uh, how best they can, they can live with and manage their, their symptoms, looking at their day-to-day -day life. Um, definitely exploring how mood, anxiety, fatigue, sleep, constipation, all of those things can have an impact on the symptoms, can really, really help. And that is something we can all do as part of our consultations with our patients. Uh, and then I think also referral on to our therapy colleagues who are, you know, are the mainstay of non-medication related management of people with Parkinson's. You know, their whole role is, is in looking at the day-to-day -day life of somebody and trying to ensure that they can live it to the best of their ability using cues and strategies and, and uh, organising their life uh, in order to, to optimise uh, their day-to-day -day life is really important. And then if, if possible, using psychological therapies uh, is also helpful. Uh, I know a lot of places don't have specialist psychological therapies for people um, with neurological conditions, uh, but I think it's something that can be really helpful. Uh, we try to use the stepped care model. So level one uh, is people with uh, mild psychological problems that might be impacting on their day-to-day -day life and their Parkinson's symptoms. So that may, may be um, us having conversations within our clinics, uh, signposting them to um, IAP services to mental wellbeing services that are available. Um, level two, maybe you want to refer to a, a specialist occupational therapist or a CBT therapist that may be available, and they can certainly help with um, more intensive psychological uh, therapy and using cognitive behavioral therapy approaches to managing Parkinson's symptoms. And then level three would be requiring a more specialist neuropsychiatric input, more, more intensive um, therapy. And, uh, We've had good success uh, in Derby with um, helping people with significant um, motor fluctuations and dyskinesia, which are impacted by anxiety and, and, and helping them to, to improve things without having to, to use medication. As I say, um, neuropsychiatric, uh, neuro, neuropsychological therapies are, are, are um, not available, especially certainly not specialist ones. So we do have to rely on our therapy colleagues to provide a lot of these, these things, particularly the occupational therapists. Their role uh, in managing Parkinson's is not just about provision of appropriate aids and equipment. Their role is much, much broader than this. Um, they, can, they can look at managing fatigue, look at daily routine, uh, look at anxiety management, uh, do uh, re teach relaxation strategies, uh, teach cognitive behavioral uh, approaches to, to managing situations. They can look at sleep, improving sleep with sleep hygiene. We use light boxes, um, OT, our OTs uh, talk to patients about that and, and use light therapy to try and help with sleep. They can help, help with goal setting where there's motivation problems. Um, they can help with cognitive strategies for people that are having mild cognitive impairment or more severe um, um, cognitive decline, uh, both teaching the, the patient and carers to use cognitive strategies to assist with day-to-day -day life, um, do assessments of boot mood, and I say do um, uh, psychological interventions, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, our occupational therapists are trained in, uh, in providing a cognitive behavioral therapy approach. 
Uh, they can give lots of advice and education on, on how to cope um, with fluctuating uh, symptoms. And they can give a lot of support to carers uh, who are um, struggling to manage uh, with supporting their loved one with Parkinson's. So I think occupational therapists have a huge role to play in, in helping us to manage people with um, uh, complex Parkinson's disease. As do our physiotherapy colleagues, um, to aiming to keep people as active as possible for as long as possible, uh, helping with interventions for gait and balance, uh, falls, posture, helping with transfers, um, giving exercise programs uh, to help to, uh, to keep um, balance, posture and transfers as strong as possible, um, teaching compensatory strategies and cueing techniques. Um, our physiotherapist is very specialist in, in using lots of cueing strategies, uh, looking at management of pain, including pain from dystonia, teaching muscle stretches, as I say, the blue glasses, and also education and educating our patients and carers about living well with Parkinson's. So I really think that our therapy colleagues, and also I've not included speech therapy, but equally speech therapy is hugely important um, in, the, in more advanced Parkinson's disease. Um, a little bit about just basal ganglia dysfunction. I think it's really important that everybody within the multidisciplinary team has a good understanding of the basal ganglia and what happens and why people with Parkinson's um, struggle greatly with uh, well-learned tasks and motor skills and uh, multitasking and switching between motor and cognitive sets and how, um, how much time is required for mental processing and executive function difficulties. And a lot of the strategies that our therapy colleagues use are around um, engaging conscious attention in what they're doing, um, ensuring concentration, um, thinking about fatigue, uh, training dual tasking where possible, but also teaching patients to avoid it when it's unsafe uh, and teaching our, the cues and strategies, both cognitive uh, cues and strategies, but also motor cues and strategies. And I think but all, if all of the team are aware of this and are aware of cues and strategies and can, can incorporate it into our, our consultations, uh, then I think, I think that, that, that's a really good, uh, a good thing to do. So a little bit more about cues, cues and strategies. Um, so encouraging patients to pay attention, uh, attending to what they're doing, um, concentrating on one thing at a time, for example, concentrating just on walking rather than walking and having a chat, walking and carrying something. All of those can, can reduce um, ability to walk safely. Um, emotional set, so thinking about how um, if, 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 we, if we think we're going to fail, we're more likely to fail. So, so if we can encourage our patients to believe they can do so if you're wanting your patient to stand up from the chair, if you positively encourage them to believe they can, they're more likely to be able to get up from the chair independently than if they're thinking, I won't be able to do this before they've even started to try to do it. So thinking about the emotional set is really important. Um, using mental rehearsal, there's a lot of evidence that if you think about how you're going to do something before you do it, um, it practices, your, brain, your brain's able to practice doing it so that it's more likely to be successful when you actually do it. Um, using an internal dialogue, so talking yourself through what you want to do. So for example, uh, counting steps one, two, one, two, or thinking big steps, big steps as you walk along, that can help. Uh, proprioception is, is kind of sensory things, so paying conscious attention uh, on where you are, how your feet are planted, uh, perhaps, um, thinking about swaying side to side before you make a step forward are, are, are proprioceptive type cues. So uh, thinking about the impact of the psychological um, um, symptoms on the physical symptoms and, and, and making patients aware of this and getting them to think with you in, in consultations about how that might be impacting uh, the whole MDT, having uh, uh, knowledge of that basal ganglia dysfunction and how cues and strategies work and using them uh, within their practice and then uh, uh, and the importance of our therapy colleagues and our psychological therapies and then uh, finally a shameless book plug and a nice new book that's just been published by colleagues of mine uh, which contains all of this information hopefully uh, <coughs> if anybody would like to buy it it is available from all good booksellers and it's currently on offer I think at 27 pounds thank you uh, thank you very much again, uh, Lisa, for that. Um, I think it really shows the complexities of Parkinson's disease. And again, 
um, trying to move away from its categorization of just a movement disorder. It's clearly way more than that. Uh, and you neatly illustrated that for us. Thank you. So without further ado, moving on to Karen, um, I'll get her to introduce herself uh, to review the um, updates regarding dietetics. Thank you. This is going to be very, very brief. Um, I was just given a brief of five, 10 minutes of a very, very quick overview of the recent update to the guidance. Um, the, there was gastric issues covered in the last webinar, which covered uh, nutritional management quite extensively. So this is just a really, really brief update about the update of our guidance that happened at the beginning of this year. Um, I'm a freelance dietitian. I've worked in neuro rehab for the last 20 years, which makes me feel really old. So apologies for that. Um, and I'm the current chair of the Neurosciences Specialist Group of the um, British Dietetic Association, which is the Professional Dietitian um, Association. Okay, so the initial best practice guidance was published way back in 2015. Um, and we were requested by the Parkinson's UK to do an update at the beginning of this year, just to bring it in line with current knowledge and, and practice. So this is just a very, very quick update of what we've looked at and what the summary of the changes are. So within the guidance, um, there is a basic introduction. It then goes through the nutritional management at different stages of Parkinson's. So it's split down into diagnosis, early disease, advanced disease, and then palliative care, a summary and references. So what we did was just looked at the whole thing, went through and just updated it in line with current guidance. So I've put new evidence here. Um, we are quite lacking in a lot of new evidence for uh, nutritional management. So majority of our, um, our new evidence was back from 2017 and 2018. So there was a number of, of nice guidelines uh, that was published in 17. They also had a very busy year in that year. So we had the new Parkinson's disease in adults, vitamin D, forms in older people, osteoporosis, and the big one from uh, dietitians was nutritional support in adults were all published in 2017. We also had ESPEN guideline for clinical nutrition and neurology and the Allied Health Professions Competency Framework for Progressive Neurological Conditions was also published in 2018. So what we wanted to do was incorporate those and make sure that whatever they covered was covered in the, the best practice guidance. Now, this is best practice guidance for dietitians, but it's really useful for the rest of the MDT to be aware of what's covered within it, just so that they're aware of the breadth of, of issues that dietitians can help with. So within the introduction, we just added some signposts into the Parkinson's UK website, um, really to, to signpost the professionals so that they could get up-to-date supporting information um, and, and general content um, for learning. So pointing them to webinars like this, um, pointing them to any updated professional guidance that's available um, for the rest of the MDT that's available on the Parkinson's UK website. And we made a recommendation to utilise the AHP competency framework in order to identify learning needs and also develop um, specialist roles. The competency framework, for those that haven't seen it, it's split down into the majority of it is for general neurological conditions. But then there are also a specialist section for one for Parkinson's, one for motor neurone and one for MS. So it is a really, really good tool to go through. It breaks down for every part of disease what people need to know at various levels. So whether you're a band five through to a band eight, what skills and knowledge you should have uh, within each of those roles. And it's really, really useful for breaking down um, your learning plans so that you can develop learning needs and develop specialist roles particularly. So the nutritional management section, um, first of all, diagnosis and early disease, we've added a lot more information in there and a lot of emphasis on the unintentional weight loss, malnutrition and dysphagia. We're still at a point where we know that the majority of our referrals um, in a lot, majority of neurological conditions, including Parkinson's, come quite late on in the disease we don't get a lot of early referrals. Um, and it's essential for establishing the baselines of people and establishing what people's nutritional intakes are and what their normal weights are to get those early referrals. So we've, we've added that information in there. 
we've signposted to the Parkinson's UK resources about looking after your bladder and bowels. And also um, we've introduced some information about the use of pre and probiotics, which were covered ex quite extensively in the ESPEN guidance. We've also reinforced the advice about antioxidants, um, vitamin E, Q enzyme Q10 um, shouldn't routinely be used. Uh, we still find that they is quite a lot of uh, confusion around these. Um, we've added some additional information on the B vitamins and particularly uh, that people should be considering whether supplementation is needed and having those discussions within the MDTs. And the additional information about vitamin D. Um, since the initial guidance was written back in 2015, there is a general recommendation that people should be taking vitamin D uh, supplementation quite across the board really especially older people so we have been added that information into the guidance so in advanced disease um, obviously in advanced disease we've got a lot of symptoms and medication issues that can impact on feeding and eating and um, resulting in weight loss or swallowing difficulties so we have quite a lot of nutritional problems going on we've added on information about silent aspiration um, I think everybody's aware of looking for the, the normal red flags for swallowing problems, but silence aspiration is still one of them that does tend to get missed. We've added in some information about short term tube feeding, um, and particularly because it's getting more increasingly popular that people can be given um, nasogastric feeds for the short term tube feeding. Whereas I think historically people have just considered gastrostomy placements. Um, it is again more increasingly popular that they will consider nasogastric feeding as well for short term. We've also given some reassurance in there about timing of gastrostomy placements. And we tend to find that, um, especially where you have maybe less experienced dietitians that are just suddenly thrown into to dealing with quite complex patients, there tends to be a worry about talking about gastrostomy if somebody's weight has not significantly altered, but they may have other indications, particularly um, hydration issues. And sometimes there can be a reluctance to talk about gastroscopy placement early on in those situations. So we've added a lot of uh, reassurance about that. We've added some additional information about osteoporosis and um, the consideration of calcium supplements may be needed. And just some background information about deep brain stimulation so that there's a much more of an awareness about this. The protein um, uh, support that we've given, so avoiding a reduction of daily protein intake so that you can maintain somebody's nutritional intake, but also considering protein redistribution if it's indicated. Um, and about discussions with the MDT about whether this is needed and whether it would be useful in these situations. We've also added some information about protein and tube feeding because one of the big difficulties is where somebody's gastrostomy fed. But one of the questions that come is what do we do about protein? Um, so we've added some supporting information about that as well. There's a lot of information about palliative care in there, and we've emphasised that patient choice should be supported. Um, a lot of feedback that we received was that if somebody is choosing not to take gastrostomy feeding um, and they are being deemed to have an unsafe swallow, that in a lot of cases people were just getting services not necessarily withdrawn, but they weren't getting the necessary support that was needed. Um, and so we've emphasised that whatever the patient's decision is, we should be supporting that decision and supporting those choices that they make and not just withdrawing the services there. So the summary is that we have reinforced that monitoring should really be uh, commencing at the outset and continuing throughout condition uh, as the condition progresses not just something that is seen as needed at the very end stages or when the complex condition uh, shows. So we really need to be throughout the disease and emphasize that needs will change and evolve throughout the progression of the disease. So it's not necessarily predictable. You can't necessarily say you know, this person will need a three monthly review, a six monthly review, a yearly review. It's going to evolve and they will need um, a constant assessment and support throughout. So the documents itself is available on the Parkinson's UK website. So the links are there um, for this. 
we do anticipate that we will probably be doing um, a yearly review of it because um, as obviously evidence comes through and things are changing, um, we will do a, a yearly update and a yearly review. So if anybody does have a look at it and has any feedback, then we would appreciate that being sent through to the neurosciences at bda.uk.com um, email address um, because it will be the neurosciences group that will undertake that review. Okay, that's my whistle stop tour of the updated guidance. Karen, thank you for that comprehensive, fantastic overview. Uh, really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to crack on um, with uh, sharing my screen, and um, we're running out of time, but that's okay because we can go quite quickly, I think. So, <clears throat> the management of symptoms, the complex stages of Parkinson's. You've heard from colleagues how challenging uh, complex. Um, management can be with the interface between motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms, because sometimes the treatments for motor symptoms really do affect non-motor symptoms, things of postural hypotension, hallucinations, et cetera. Dopaminergic therapies just exacerbate those. So there's science uh, in the treatment of complex Parkinson's disease, but I would argue it's also a bit of an art as well. So just to start off with a case, 67-year-old single uh, lady who's had Parkinson's for seven years. She's fit, she's active, she plays tennis, she's independent, she drives. She's on Sastravi 100, uh, cobanyl dopa, um, modified release, and also um, a little bit of dispersible uh, ripinerol, 12 milligrams XL. So relatively conventional. She's probably on quite a bit more than you might expect at seven years. Um, but a relatively conventional regime, nevertheless. During the clinic assessment, however, she has mild dyskinesia at peak dose. Now, remember what Lisa was saying about troublesome dyskinesia. Often the patients aren't troubled by their dyskinesia. It's the observer that is more troubled. And I think it's important to make that distinction. What matters to the patient is important. But she's wearing off at the end of dose. And she's got this phenomenon of non-motor wearing off, which is a really important thing to remember. Uh, people often uh, talk about motor fluctuations, but non-motor fluctuations are also important. So panic and low mood. I've got a patient that bursts into tears uh, as she wears off, and she just can't stop crying until she has more uh, levodopa. Also, clawing of toes, which is more motoric and increased tremor. She has a very slow morning on, which is familiar uh, to some patients. So it takes up to 90 minutes uh, to get on from taking her first tablet. And she occasionally feels that the dose isn't working at all. So dose failure or no on. She's had mild impulse control behaviors on higher doses of ripinerol. She is constipated, which is the bane of quite a lot of Parkinson's disease patients' lives. And she has subtle swallowing difficulties in the off state. So think about sort of big tablets that might be more challenging to, uh, to take. And also when you're thinking of how we might manage this patient, um, if we just give her more Rapinarol, she's likely to get more impulse control and buy more handbags, which is what she was doing before. So what is happening? And, and, and Lisa alluded to this. We've got a narrow, uh, narrowing therapeutic window. When you start the Parkinson's journey at diagnosis stage, the therapeutic window is really wide. And it's easy to stick within that in terms of uh, therapeutic um, effect. As the Parkinson's journey extends, the therapeutic window narrows, and so it's much more difficult to stay within it. When you bounce upwards, you become dyskinetic. When you bounce under, you become off very basically, although you can have biphasic dyskinesia. And so you can see here in the infographic why wearing off happens and why you have a delayed on uh, at the beginning of doses sometimes. So what we have to think about is how we fragment doses or how we use uh, advanced therapeutics to traverse that narrowing therapeutic window and avoid going above and below that line. So what medication strategies do we have at our disposal? I mean, you'll all be aware of the best, the gold standard uh, medication, levodopa, in the form of cocaroldopa and cobenaldopa, and also duodopa, uh, which is the intrajeginal infusion. Um, and uh, this just increases the amount of dopamine available at the synapse. If we uh, introduce a COMPT inhibitor, because uh, levodopa is broken down, dopamine is broken down by COMPT and MAO, uh, both enzymes of dopamine breakdown, um, that can make more levodopa available. And then we have dopamine uh, agonists, as you'll be aware, 
and the MAO inhibitors. Um, and then we have amantadin to uh, try to reduce dyskinesia. And as you're aware, as it was alluded to before, amantadine comes with its own problems, uh, postural hypotension, worsening cognition, etc. And in order to traverse that narrow therapeutic window, we also look to uh, advanced therapeutics, uh, things like DBS, uh, duodopa, apomorphine. Um, and often these can be uh, things worth considering if people are having dyskinesia and off periods, because if you just increase dopaminergic therapies, they get more dyskinesia and distress. So how do we approach these, uh, these patients? Well, I think it's important that we recognize um, things such as gastroparesis. This patient is not emptying their stomach as well as they should be, particularly early in the morning when they're off, which is leading to delayed ons. And this may be con uh, continuing. Uh, things like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is common in, but poorly recognized in Parkinson's patients. So we need to be thinking about that if people are having more delayed ons or having dose failure. It's important that we review other medications. Polypharmacy is common in older patients. They accrue lots of medications. And one of the most dangerous medications that you can give to, a, uh, to an older patient is an anticholinergic. Things like oxybutynin, tolteridine, um, amitriptyline. There was a great study in JAMA in 2019 that so shows that this increases your risk of death, increases your risk of falling, uh, increases um, uh, your risk of lots of things, including dementia. And so anticholinergics need to be removed because that will slow gastric transit and also lead to uh, other problems. We talked about, sort of, have, has the patient got a protein binding issue? If they're associating their medications with food, is the protein um, uh, competing? Constipation, constipation, constipation. We need to treat constipation in all our patients, otherwise they have erratic absorption and slow uh, 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 transit. We know the concordance in Parkinson's patients is challenging sometimes. Uh, the Grosset studies in the, in the 90s, well, the early 2000s showed that. And we, need, we know that they're poorly hydrated, which affects um, um, optimal um, medication delivery. So what are the options in this patient? I would ordinarily ask people, but let me take you through them. We could fractionate the dose to Stilevo uh, 100, 710, 1, 4, and 7. But the patient, uh, we did that, but the slightly less wearing off at the end of dose, but increasingly slow to get going. So that doesn't really seem like it covers things. Could we increase the dose? Well, we could get moved to the next dose up of, of Stilevo to one, two, five each dose time. This would invariably to increase dyskinesia, but not really change the fact that this patient is slow to get going in the morning because we're not really doing anything about the morning dose and its absorption. Could we add another enzyme inhibitor? Which one would we add? We've got a choice between selegiline, mesagiline, and safinamide. Selegiline, dangerous drug in my, in my opinion, amphetamine metabolites, not great, sometimes useful in young patients for alertness, but I'd avoid it. Safinamide is relatively useful for increasing on time without worsening dyskinesia. But by doing this, very slight improvement in on time, but no change in morning symptoms. Could we increase the rapinarol? It's a fair point, but remember, the patient had impulse control behaviors uh, and so that doesn't seem like a, 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 a good idea in this situation. Could we switch to an agent which has less likelihood of causing impulse control behavior because it's got less preferential D3 receptor agonism and so should have less um, impulse control? Well, yes, we could, um, but it's a slightly weaker agonist. Uh, and so there may be marginal improvements, but the on-state will still be challenging first thing in the morning. So what we opted to do was to use an APO-GO penject on waking and then PRN through the day. So using the APO-PEN first thing in the morning, started movement earlier, achieved the on-state better, and then the patient was much better as the day wore on. And obviously that increased her confidence. So just moving on to another case quickly, um, time is running away with us. Patient uh, Mrs. A had Parkinson's again for seven or eight years. Um, described worse in function, cognitive numbness, everything taking longer with nausea and headache, and feeling that she was wearing off at the end of dose and actually throughout the day. 
And her husband actually reported that she was no longer keeping up um, and actually reported that she'd stopped doing the washing up, uh, which was a very strange thing to say, but um, was, is relevant. So she's on cobenaldopa, ripinerol, rosazolin, oxybutynin, aspirin, and meprazole, citalopram. Remember what I said about anticholinergics, oxybutynin is a very dangerous anticholinergic, so that immediately drew my attention. So um, the most important thing is to think about what we can do in clinic about this patient and what we're thinking. So actually, what she's not experiencing, I don't think, is poor um, absorption of medication um, or wearing off. I had an inkling because of the nausea and the headache that we needed to do uh, an important test, which is a take home message, which was to measure her blood pressure. But if we just measure her SAT in clinic blood pressure, which is what GP practices normally do, not very useful information. That's a normal blood pressure. So we think hmm, there's nothing up with her blood pressure. So we lie her down. Again, no uh, particular problem. Stand her up, still no problem. Stand her up for a bit longer, still no problem. But we have to stand her for three minutes. And there we see what's happening when she's standing at the kitchen sink. She plummets her blood pressure. She gets nausea. She gets headache. She gets um, all those symptoms of feeling cognitively numb um, and uh, will eventually fall over if it, was, if it got worse or she'd had a heavy meal or alcohol or anything. It's important to recognize orthostatic hypotension, and I think it is under-recognized in our patient groups. And we need to measure it in every single patient coming through, otherwise we will miss it. Standing at one and three minutes, and five minutes if you're convinced by the history. But it affects a lot of people, and it's under-reported unless you ask specific questions about headache, the coat hanger ache because of under-perfusion of the muscles, it's more common after eating because the blood goes to the splanchnic circulation and the gut and away from the brain, and it's definitely worsened by dopa. So what to do? So let's check for other contributory medications, the antihypertensives, the anticholinergics, et cetera, et cetera. Increase fluids. Before we reach for the prescription pad, let's think about how we reduce the chances of all static hypertension happening. Caffeine and salt, really important and then advising around above knee uh, compression stockings, above knee much, much better than the below knee ones. What medications might we use for this once we've done all that? Well, fludrocortisone is a common uh, medication, 50 micrograms start dose all the way up to 500 micrograms, sometimes in divided doses. But this can cause supine hypertension and swelling of the ankles as common side effects. Midodrin, um, is uh, an important medication and is the first line uh, guidance and the nice guidance um, for orthostatic hypertension. Uh, the dose, 2.5 milligrams three times a day uh, and normally 8, 12 and 4 so as not to increase the supine blood pressure. But this can cause, as I say, supine blood pressure increase um, and the phenomena of supine hypertension orthostatic hypotension syndrome. Other medications that we can use to treat postural hypotension are varied, um, and I think it's, it's worthwhile considering the use of these. Um, domperidone is quite useful, apart from the prolongation of the QT. Um, we use 10 milligrams TDS. It's useful for nausea, but it's also useful for, push, for pushing blood pressure up. Pyridostigmine has an emerging evidence base and is very useful uh, as a reversible cholinesterase inhibitor and it enhances the sympathetic ganglionic transmission. Normally start at 15 milligrams three times a day, all the way up to 120 milligrams three times a day. Worthwhile thinking about the symptoms of cardiovascular dysautonomia in terms of loss of confidence, that coat hanger ache, um, postprandial hypertension, and also sometimes angina because of the reduction in uh, perfusion of the coronary vessels. Just to reiterate uh, the points about non-motor wearing off symptoms, they're quite wide ranging, uh, but they're, they're not recognized as well as the motor symptoms. So people get pain, anxiety, abnormal sensations, um, and you know, the pain can be quite significant, uh, and panic and anxiety, um, and also sweating at the post-dose. These are non-motor wearing off phenomena. We've got about two minutes. So I'm just going to whip through this one really, really quickly, just to say this lady fell over. She had a Collie's fracture. 
She then became extremely immobile. And I was called uh, and she uh, had basically reduced in her function significantly until she couldn't speak, she couldn't move. And everybody was, very, she ended up being admitted to ED. This was, lady was a championship bridge player. I got a courtesy call from the ED registrar to say, I think this lady's end of life. We're gonna put her through the CT scanner, but I think she's probably had a large bleed. So I said, break down the GCS for me. And there's the GCS, E4, M1, V2. So she's not moving, she's not speaking, but her eyes are very, very alert. So just, uh, I controversially saw the patient and examined her. Um, and uh, that was her stomach, that was her abdomen, sorry. And that was her CT scan. And if we go back, we can see that Zydol, uh, 200 milligrams modified release, she'd broken her wrist, she'd been given a massive dose of tramadol, she'd become extremely constipated with gastroparesis, and she basically stopped absorbing all medications. When we did an endoscopy, all we found were capsules of um, cobinol dapa in her, um, in her stomach, um, and they hadn't been absorbed. They had to be taken out and retrieved, otherwise they would all be absorbed. She had to be surgically disimpacted um, so this is just a cautionary tale. And this lady responded very well to reticotine transdermally. She came on again, and she certainly wasn't end of life. But um, just a cautionary note, particularly about tramadol, which is not a great drug. So I think um, I've mentioned constipation and how important it is and delayed gastric emptying. And also just to finish with small intestine bacterial overgrowth, is something that is much more being recognized. And some studies have shown that 40 to 50% of patients with Parkinson's disease have a degree of SIBO. And um, I think we need to recognize that and use the testing with um, uh, breath testing uh, to see whether this, occur uh, this is occurring and treat it with antibiotics because I've had various patients that have improved significantly following treatment. So we need to have holistic and individualized care and just recognize that one size certainly does not fit all when we're treating Parkinson's disease. We need to individualize you know, what matters to the patient. This is not textbook protocolized medicine. This is what matters to the patient. Remember that Parkinson's is multi-system, multi-neurotransmitter dysfunction. It's not just dopamine. Recognize which symptoms matter to the patient in terms of their quality of life, because after all, that's why we're here to improve the quality of life for the patient. Rationalize those dopaminergic therapies, and realign with those non motor uh, therapies too, and constantly review the situation. And with that, um, I think we're just a little bit over time. So um, I will pause there just to see whether there are any immediate questions that have been raised. Um, so looking at the questions and answers, um, there's a question about camptochormia and Pisa syndrome, uh, questioning whether they're forms of dystonia. So that's a difficult question to answer, but looking at Pisa syndrome, also called pleurothotonus, is actually a segmental truncal dystonia. And similarly, camptochormia can be dystonic and it can respond to uh, dopamine but also can be caused by some of the medications, particularly the cholinesterase inhibitors and that kind of thing. So it needs a, a, a good review. Um, is tramadol indicated for those with PD? No, 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 and no, and no. Tramadol is a horrible medication um, and uh, particularly be careful using it with um, serotonin um, for um, SSRIs because you can induce a serotonin syndrome. I've seen people very, very unwell following that, but I would just avoid it and use um, simple analgesia and think about things like butrans patches. Um, um, uh, would you recommend patients to source blue lens glasses from rehab purposes? I'll hand over to Lisa just to answer that. I mean, not necessarily. There's not a lot of evidence. I think there's one or two papers. Um, I think for some people in our in our experience, we have seen it work to some degree. Um, and you can actually get them from the local from an optician. You can ask for a blue tint in lenses. Um, I'm not completely sure of the rationale. I know our physios uh, tries it, but yeah. um, we don't. There's a handful of patients have tried the glasses. I think the evidence base is pretty uh, scant in terms of that. And I'm, 
I've never been convinced that it works. For no. people do I think it's quite it. transient. It might work initially. There could yeah. be some placebo involved. It's like CBD oil. It's worth a go. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, stop um, rambling. Uh, and um, if people like to have a 30-second break, but actually I think um, in the interests of time and to give... Uh, the symposium enough time we'll go straight over to that if that's okay